Last week, we listened to Jesus as he instructed the multitudes to fear God, not wealth. Remember, according to Jesus, God calls the man or woman who fears wealth, and by that I mean the one who responds to prosperity, as we saw in our text last week, by building bigger barns for his own ease, his own security, his own pleasure. God calls that man or woman a fool. And according to Jesus, the fear of God and the fleeting nature of our lives should propel us to be generous with what we have. We concluded last week in Luke 12, 21, where Jesus called for his disciples and the multitude to be rich towards God. So this morning, I want to begin with a question. What would it look like if we, if you and I, if our families, if this church really took Jesus seriously concerning fearing God, not wealth? What would that look like? What would happen if we trusted God for our lives instead of looking to our possessions to give us life? What would happen if you began to give tithes and offerings? By definition, this means giving 10% of your gross income to the Lord. Moreover, a free will offering implies giving an amount greater than your tithe or separate from your tithe that the law demanded. What would happen to you? If you did this out of a healthy fear of God, would you starve? Would you no longer be able to pay your rent and mortgage? Would you be left for dead when the time comes for you to pay some needed repair or necessary maintenance on your home or car? Your answers to these questions matter to Jesus. Think with me for a minute. What would happen if we really got serious about being rich towards God with our prosperity? Increasing our standard of giving versus increasing our standard of living. What would happen? What if we began budgeting to give regularly to the poor? Or to evangelize the lost that surround us? I mean, by definition, this would be another bucket in your budget altogether. This would be giving beyond your tithes and free will offerings. So what would happen to you? Would you have to cut out Netflix? Or Hulu? Would you need to drive an older car? Or use an older model phone? Would you still be able to have a roof over your head? Would you be forced to downsize your home? Would you have to seek a more modest vacation? But if you did this out of a healthy fear of God, would your life be better or worse? Your answer says so much about your theology. What would happen if we, like the widow of Zarephath, sacrificially gave in accordance with the Spirit's leading? By sacrificially, I mean putting ourselves truly at risk, at the mercy of God, by giving beyond our human means. Would God really have your back? Would God let you go hungry or starve? Would God punish you for placing your trust in Him? Would your testimony for eternity be one of regret? Well, I stepped out in faith, I followed Jesus, and he let me sink. I mean, there was no compensatory blessing, no honor he eternally bestowed. You see, 
It's one thing to talk about trusting in God's provision. But it's another thing entirely to intentionally place yourself in a situation that necessitates His provision. Now, just in case the fear of wealth feels foreign to you, you're at home and you're saying like, dude, I don't, I don't get why people struggle. Just in case the fear of wealth feels foreign to you, I challenge you, make a commitment today to start radically giving more of your wealth away. And I guarantee you, as you begin to practice being rich towards God, by being generous in your efforts to advance His kingdom, you'll gain a fresh understanding of what the negative fear of wealth is all about the fear of want. As you, like the multitudes, consider giving yourself wholeheartedly to living for Christ and advancing His kingdom, without question, fearful thoughts will arise in the back of your mind. Asking, who will take care of me in my time of need? This is especially true if you aren't like the rich fool we covered last week in verses 16 through 20. By that, here's what I mean. If you're sitting there today at home, and like so many in our current trial, you're not prospering. You're not right now in need of building bigger barns. I mean, what if you're more like the multitude listening to Jesus? living from one harvest to the next, or as we'd put it in our day, paycheck to paycheck. What if you find yourself in the shoes of the disciples? Think about this for a minute. The disciples laid off without work, in between jobs, completely dependent upon the generosity of others. If we, as part of the crowd, or hopefully as one of his disciples, have been listening well to Jesus, if we purpose in our hearts to be rich towards God by being generous towards others, we'll inevitably come face to face with the negative side of the fear of wealth, the fear of want. You see, the positive side of the fear of wealth, which we primarily dealt with last week, is the false belief that more things, more stuff, more you fill in the blank will cause us to flourish. Jesus addressed the positive side of the fear of wealth in verse 13 through 21. Again, we covered that last week. What we're honing in on today is the negative side of the fear of wealth. And the negative side of the fear of wealth is the fear of being in want. It's the fear of being in need with no one or no means to supply. This is Jesus' focus in verses 22 through 31. This is today's text. Now Luke's desire is that those who fear God his disciples, Theophilus, and us today, reading his gospel. His desire is that we would become fearless in our generosity, or, we could use another phrase, in our pursuits of advancing God's kingdom above all other things. Luke wants us to be fearless. Particularly as we grow in understanding our Father's love. Therefore, my aim this morning is to convince you, jury, sitting at home, determining whether or not I'm boring, interesting, should get another job. My point is to convince you that those who fear God can, I mean, it's possible and ought, that means it, it should happen, in, in some sense it must happen, be fearless in their generosity, their willingness to let go, their willingness to give things away, their willingness to give of themselves to advance and pursue the kingdom of God. So 
So, as I seek to convince you, let me first defend the claim those who fear God can and ought be fearless. Those who fear God can and ought be fearless. Everything that Jesus says in verse 22 31 is specifically directed to his disciples. By this I mean that it applies to them and only them or those who join with them in their submission to Jesus. Look at verse 22. And he said to, say it with me now, his disciples. Keep in mind from our text last week, Luke 12, 31 through 21, Keep in mind that last week's test was addressed to the multitudes or the crowds. Look back at verse 13 through 15. Verse 13, someone in the crowd said to him. And then in verse 14, he responds to that someone. But then in verse 15, as he launches into the teaching, which we covered last week, he said to them. And here's the question, who's that? Who's the them? Well, according to verse 13, it's the Crowds, it's the multitudes. Now, this not, may not seem like a big deal, but, but this is a huge key. This is a very important distinction which allows us to notice how Jesus' teaching adjusts in accordance with who he's talking to. To the multitudes, including his disciples, he says, Fear God, not well. This applies to everyone, without exception. However, to his disciples, who possess a growing healthy fear of God and unique relationship to him as his children, and he their father, he says, don't fear. Be generous, knowing how much you are loved. And this is why I say those who fear God can and ought be fearless. Now this pattern should be somewhat familiar to us now. I mean, if you're thinking back over the several past weeks, you might recall that this same pattern characterized Jesus' instruction concerning the fear of God, not man, found in Luke 12, verses 1 through 12. Think with me for a minute. Concerning fearing God, not man, Jesus said to his disciples in front of the multitude, fear God, not man. He did that in verse 4 and 5, and then in verse 6 and 7, he clarified to those who feared God, fear not. Do you see that? To those who feared God, fear not. For you are more valuable than many sparrows. Watch this pattern now. The one who fears God ought in some sense be fearless. Right? This was laid out for us at the beginning of the chapter. So he said it once with reference to the Father, and then the pattern repeated again in verses 8 and 9 as Jesus says, Fear the Son of Man. Not man, or in that day, the Pharisees. Now, as you chew on the substance of what Jesus was saying in verses 8 and 9, you realize that those who confessed him before men ought be fearless to stand before the angels of God on the great day of judgment. Why? Because the Son of Man has promised them a very definitive group, those who fear him, by way of confessing him before men, that he will acknowledge them. So now watch this for a second time. The one who fears God is enabled to be fearless. And if twice wasn't enough, the pattern appears for a third time as Jesus called his disciples to fear the Spirit. In verse 10, Jesus says, Fear the Spirit. As he warns, the one who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. Yet in verse 11 and 12, to his disciples, who have a growing fear of God's Spirit, he promises, do not be anxious or fearful. 
Why? For the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. For the third time, you can call me Captain Obvious. The one who fears God ought be fearless. I'm detecting a subtle theme. In light of this, should we be surprised to hear Jesus now encourage his disciples to be fearless with reference to their possessions as they continue to follow Christ along the path of fearing God? Should we be surprised? I think not. So we've seen that those who fear God can and ought be fearless. Now, we need to make a shift. I want us to pause for a moment and consider this question. How will Jesus accomplish this transformation? I'm speaking to a group of potentially fearful people. I am a fearful man. The more I go to give away, the more fear rises up in me. So so how is Jesus going to transform my heart so that he might transform my behavior? How's he going to accomplish that? He's already told me he wants to accomplish that, but how's it actually going to happen? And the answer is Jesus seeks to transform his disciples with and through the truth of his word. This is how all transformation takes place. Through the Word. He sanctifies us through His truth. His Word is truth. So in verses 22 through 31, Jesus utilizes five arguments as His means of growing fearless in the hearts of fearlessness in the hearts of those who fear God. So, so this, in essence, at this juncture, is the sermon. Jesus is going to bam, 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 bam. Shoot out five bullets of logic. Truth bombs, if you will. With the intent of blowing up any sense of fear in you so that you might become fearless in your generosity, in your willingness to give of yourself to advance His kingdom. We're going to work through the text verse by verse, so I hope you have your Bible out and you're following along. We'll take notice of each argument as our Lord presents it. So look with me at our text, verse 22 and 23. Therefore, I tell you. Now the word therefore links this text with what Jesus has instructed prior concerning fearing God, not wealth. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious. Do not be fearful. Do not be worried about your life. What you will eat. Nor, by way of ellipses, be anxious, fearful, worried about your body, what you'll put on. Now look at verse 23, how it begins. For, all right, this indicates grounds or some rationale. Here is the first line of argumentation. So pay close attention, perhaps underline it, mark it down in your text. Jesus says, Why be fearless? Life is more than food, and the body more than clothing. Life is more than food, and the body more than clothing. So what is argument number one? I'll use my own words here. Argument number one, generosity, as part of God's path of obedience, yields life. All right, let me say that again. Argument number one. Generosity as a part of God's robust path of obedience. Generosity yields life. You want to live? Give. This is the essence of what Jesus is getting at. According to Jesus, true life is more than mere food and clothing. Now, food and clothing are important. Amen? I heard a few of those at home. No one, including God, wants mankind to go around naked and hungry. However, these things do not define life. They merely facilitate life. True life is a gift from God, mediated to us by His Spirit, as a result of heeding His 
word. This reality was established in the ancient garden. And it continues this side of Eden. Life throughout Scripture, or God's blessings, if you will, has always been understood as God's being gracious. It's, it's God's gracious fruit given to those who prioritize His Word. Listen to Job, one of the earliest prophetic voices. Listen to what Job said in Job 23.12. Job 23.12. Listen to this. I have not departed from the commandments of his lips. I have treasured the words of God's mouth more than my portion of food. All right, think with me. Why would Job say this? Why? And Job himself, remember, was a wealthy man. Food, in some sense, kept Job alive. Yet Job, who had eaten about everything under the sun, would testify food never caused him to truly live. Only walking God's path of obedience brought true life to Job. Now, let's move on from Job. Let's consider, as our second witness, the insights of David the psalmist. In Psalm 19, verses 7 through 11. Oh, y'all meditate on that later. Psalm 19, 7 through 11. Listen to what David says. The law of the Lord is perfect. I mean, it's complete, it's robust, it's everything you need, fully sufficient for what? Reviving, restoring, converting your soul. In essence, giving your soul life. And so he then says, more to be desired are they, the laws of the Lord, than gold, even much fine gold, but look where he goes here, sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. So why would David value God's word above material provisions? Why would David do that? The answer that he gives is clear. It is obedience to God's word that brought David life. Friends, is this not exactly what Jesus taught us? Remember what he quoted to the serpent in the wilderness? Man shall not live by bread alone. How then shall we live? By every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Through hearing and heeding God's word. Or how about what he said to his disciples in the upper room? If you know these things, John 13, 7, 17. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. So here's what I'm saying. From the garden to Gethsemane to the soon coming great day of the Lord, the consistent message of Scripture is that true life is enjoyed by those who hear and heed God's word. True life is enjoyed by those who hear and heed God's word. Jesus reminds his disciples in our text that true life is not enjoyed by way of food and clothing. Therefore, it, food and clothing, should not be the primary pursuit of his people. Did you hear that? We should fear God, not wealth. Getting stuff will not bring you life. However, giving it away does bring you life. Because generosity, as part of God's path of obedience, yields life. Brothers and sisters, our cultural traditions substantiate this reality. Just, just pause with me and reflect. Ask any adult at Christmas, particularly one who's a parent or some sort of loving guardian, which is better, getting or giving at Christmas? Hands down, Christmas has only gotten better for Daddy Lehman throughout the years. I love it. Ask any corporate volunteer 
Who walks away more blessed after spending a day serving meals at a homeless shelter? The one who served the meals or the one being served the meals? Hands down again. The one who gave the service walks away more blessed than the one being rendered the service. Ask any passionate chef. Which is better? The joy of tasting a perfectly cooked dish. Or the joy of seeing approving smiles brought to the faces of satisfied diners sitting at your table. Hands down. It's always better to give than to receive because giving yields life. Remember in Jesus' upside down kingdom, the way to gain life is to first give it away. Let's hasten on to Jesus' next argument because he has so much more to say. So we're going to continue working our way through the text as we pick up in verse 24. Consider the ravens. This is interesting. This is an insignificant and unclean animal according to Jewish law. Therefore, most Jews would consider the raven least worthy of God's attention and provision. Consider the ravens. Okay. They neither sow nor reap. They have neither storehouse nor barn. Kind of makes us think of the prior story all about building bigger barns, and yet God feeds them. Now look at this. Here's the second argument. Underline it. Of how much more value are you than the ravens? Right? Of how much more value are you, image bearer, than the ravens? Therefore, argument number two, in my own words, is this. If God delights to feed the ravens, and friend, he does. How much more does he delight to feed you, his image bearer? And he does. Oh, friend, I want you to see this. Your giving merely provides God with a fresh opportunity to pursue his own joy. Do you see that? You're giving. You're letting go. All of a sudden, creates a new need in your life. This gives God a fresh opportunity to do what he loves to do, to be God. If he delights to feed the ravens, how much more does he delight to feed you? Oh, friend, I don't believe that Jesus for a moment plucked this out of thin air. I believe Jesus knew his scriptures well. Perhaps Jesus was thinking of the reflections of the psalmist in Psalm 147 who said the following concerning God. He gives to the beasts their food and to the young ravens that cry. Caca, caca. Or perhaps he's recalling what the Lord inquired of Job in Job 38, 39 through 41. Who provides for the raven its prey when its young ones cry to God for help? and wander about for lack of food. And what is the answer to these questions? Who does that? God. And he does it joyfully. Child of God, I want you to think, will the God who ordained your life, its purpose and positioning in accordance with his plan, will he not provide with you, he, will he not provide you with everything you need to accomplish his purpose and plan? If this is so, and it is, why worry? Okay, I'm going to say that one more time. If the God who ordained your life in eternity past, establishing its purpose, decreeing its position, all in accordance with his plan, if that very God did those things, will that same God not provide you with everything you need to accomplish his purpose and plan? Jesus argues his disciples cannot be fearless in their generosity because generosity gives life. That was... Argument number one. And then we've just seen because our God delights to supply our needs. Now let's continue to the third argument for being fearless. It's found in verse 25 and 26. So look back at your text. 
And which of you, by being anxious, which of you through fear, through worry, can add a single hour to his span of life? If then you are not able to do as small a thing as that, why are you anxious, worried, fearful about the rest? Okay? So if you can't, in some translations, add a cubit to the height of your stature, if you can't add a span to the length of your life, if you can't do that, then why are you worried about the rest? So argument number three, I would put this way. Worry accomplishes nothing. Again, worry accomplishes nothing, yet in contrast, generosity furthers the kingdom. Right? So worry does nothing. It doesn't, it doesn't lengthen your life. It doesn't change what God's decreed concerning the length of your life, positively or negatively. So if worry does nothing, why worry? Yet, yet think of the context. What does giving do? Well, it gives me life. It furthers the kingdom. So according to the writers of Scripture, the number of your days or the span of your life is fixed by our sovereign God. And I know that for some listening, you, you may not be aware of this. You may not be aware that in Scripture, the days of your life have already been written in permanent ink. Where do we find this teaching? Well, Job gives us part of it. He said to his friends in Job 14.5, man's days are determined. Okay, let me say that again. Man's days are determined. Could we get any clearer? And the number of his months is with God. God has appointed his limits that he cannot pass. Job believed that God was sovereign over man's days. But this just wasn't unique to Job. Again, we find the psalmist operating out of this conviction. Notice what the psalmist says in Psalm 139, 16. God, your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book, God, were written every one of them the days formed for me. When as yet there was none of them. So God, David claims that God wrote his days before his days. Jesus wants his disciples to understand the futility of worry. Friend, friend, your worrying contributes nothing to the preservation of your life. Or in the context of this passage, the supplying of your needs. And just get on Google and search out the effects of worry upon your health. It does nothing positive and so many things negative. Washing your hands may help you remain healthy. And I endorse that. Donning a mask in a highly trafficked area may protect you from infection and prepare you to rob a bank. But no amount of fearing, hear me now, Mom, no amount of fearing or worrying will add any span to your life. Jesus is not condemning responsible action, but he is condemning sinful anxiety. For your days have been written long ago in permanent ink in God's holy book long before COVID-19 existed. If this is true, and it is, then why worry? Your worry accomplishes nothing. In stark contrast to the futility of worry, Generosity actually accomplishes something. It furthers the kingdom of God. It furthers in your life and the life of the person you're being generous to the reality of God's rule in the affairs of men. Now Jesus will delve deeper into this argument in verses 32 through 34, which we're going to cover in depth next week, so I'm going to continue on to our next argument. By way of quick review, I'm arguing that those who fear God can and should be fearless in their generosity or pursuit of God's kingdom above all other things. And as we're working through Luke 12, 22-31, Jesus is presenting five arguments to encourage his disciples to be fearless with reference to their generosity. There is no place for fear, worry, or anxiety. First argument, 
Generosity gives life. Second argument, it's the Father's joy to supply his creation. And his image bearers will certainly benefit from him supplying their needs. Argument three, worry accomplishes nothing. And it stands in stark contrast to generosity, which actually accomplishes something. Advancing the kingdom of God upon the earth. Now we're ready for Jesus' fourth argument. It's found in verse 27 and 28. Look at the scripture and then consider Christ's argument. Verse 27. Consider the lilies. How they grow, they neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass, which is alive in the field today and tomorrow thrown into the oven, then how much more will he clothe you, O oh, you of little faith? Let me say that again. How much more will he clothe you, O oh, you of little faith? This is the fourth argument. Let me give it to you in my words. If God delights to clothe the lilies, how much more does he delight to clothe you, image bearer? Now, as you think about this, God delights to clothe the lilies. He, de he also delights to clothe you. Boy, this sounds really similar to a prior argument, and it is. His reputation is amplifying the argument. Again, your giving provides God another opportunity to pursue his own joy. He loves clothing you. All right, pause for a minute. Everyone at home, look this way. Zoom in. Teenagers, wake up. Look this way. I hate shopping. Nothing could be more boring than walking with my wife into a clothing store while she looks for clothing. I love my wife. Hate the process. But you know one thing I do love? The only thing I do love, I'm horrible at picking, her, picking out something she'd actually wear. Horrible at that. But you know what I do love? I love clothing my wife. Why? Because I delight in being her husband. It is my joy. How much more does God delight in clothing you? 1 Kings 10, 1 through 4 gives us a glimpse of the glory of Solomon's material wealth. I want you to listen closely. The queen of Sheba heard of the fame of Solomon concerning the name of the Lord, so she came to test him with hard questions. She came to Jerusalem with a very great retinue, with camels bearing spices, very much gold and precious stones. And when she came to Solomon, she told him all that was on her mind, and Solomon answered all her questions. There was nothing hidden for the king that he could not explain to her. And when the king, queen of Sheba had seen all the wisdom of Solomon, the house that he had built, the food at his table, the seating of his officials, the attendants of his servants, look at this, their clothing, his cupbearers, his burnt offerings that he offered at the house of the Lord, there was no breath left in her. <gasps> Speechless. And Jesus here reminds us that God beautifully clothes the seemingly insignificant flower more splendidly than any of Solomon's runway models. And that we as God's image bearers are so much more precious to him than a perennial flower. Therefore, hear me now, hear me now. Meeting your needs is not a bother nor a bore to God. It is his joy to supply you with everything you need to accomplish his purposes. Again, God delights in being God to you. Keep in mind, our God has many different means of clothing us. Sometimes he provides us with more work and the strength to engage it. Didn't he do this time and time again with Paul? The traveling tent maker. At other times, like with the children of Israel, he preserves what we already have. Our sandals and our clothing do not wear out. Many times, he works through the generosity of his friends, neighbors, 
at times we're even blessed by a complete stranger. And we see that frequently throughout the scriptures. And occasionally, for us contemporary livers, he's given us things we call thrift shops, where we can benefit from the excess of others. Regardless how he achieves it, our God delights to clothe us. Now, if you've been listening carefully, you may be noticing how Jesus' argument has been building. And we're about to reach its climax, argument number five. Twice already we've been pointed to consider God's love. As we enter into verse 29 and 30, we reach the pinnacle of Jesus' argumentation. The contemplation of his fatherly love. Read along with me, verse 29 through 31. And do not, now I'm going to inject a word. I'm going to inject the word primarily. I'm going to explain why in a moment, but I do believe it will bring clarity. Do not primarily seek what you're to eat, what you're to drink, nor be worried. For all the nations of the world primarily seek after these things. I mean, go back to verse 15. Their mantra is, life consists in the abundance of the things that you possess. Therefore, they pursue it. Your father knows that you need them. Instead, primarily seek his kingdom. And these things will be added to you. Now, you might be thinking to yourself for a minute, whoa there, preacher. Where did you get the primarily? Why are you adding? Don't add, don't take away. I don't see them in my text. And friend, they're not in my text either. Well, I find this clarification by consulting Matthew's presentation of this teaching material. Matthew 6.33, which says the following. But seek you first. And by that, I take first as being primarily. The kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. Throughout Scripture, God commands humanity to work. Work existed before the fall. Work is a really good gift of God. Do not forget Paul's exhortation to idle Christians in Thessalonica. 2 Thessalonians 3.10 If anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. Christ's correction in our text is a matter of priority and intent. Don't live like the godless nations of the world. The nations that I am not a covenant father to. Don't, don't live like them as they labor to accumulate stuff believing that building bigger barns is the essence of really living. Instead, we are freed. As we remember, we have a heavenly father who's given us a work to do. Ours is to advance his kingdom. His is to supply us with everything we need in order to be a success. This leads us to the thrust of argument number five. In my own words, you have a heavenly father. He's a good father who loves his children. So act like it. All right, let me, let me say it again. This is why we need not fear. This is why we are called to a lifestyle of radical generosity. Because we know something the world may not know. I can give away in accordance with God's spirit and the advancement of his kingdom because I have a Father in heaven who loves me more than you will ever know. And he delights to supply me with everything I need to accomplish his purposes for me. Brothers and sisters, when we live controlled by the fear of want, our lives, whether we realize it or not, are riddled with unbelief. And now, now we're kind of getting down to the heart of the matter, our unbelief. Did you notice how Jesus spoke to the heart of this when he called his disciples in verse 28? You of little faith. Now, pause for a minute. When you fret after you've given or when you don't give because of fear, fear of want, what exactly are you disbelieving? Disbelieving. 
First, I'd say you're disbelieving that God's given you a clear purpose. That's what you're disbelieving. Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. That was the original command. And we are called to follow the second Adam as he works to expand the kingdom. Go into all the world and make disciples of every nation. When you become consumed with, well, how am I going to pay for this? And this is some need that you have in your life. You're disbelieving God's mission for you. And are rather seeking to pick up his mission. Providing for the needs of his children. Right? Whose job is that? It's not yours. It's his. And he loves it. He loves it. So I would suggest that when we fear after giving or when fear excuses us from giving, we're disbelieving our mission. Ours is to advance. His is to supply. I would like to suggest to you that secondly, we're disbelieving that He's a loving Heavenly Father. Is our Father a good Father? I I didn't ask, is your Father on earth a good Father? I I asked, is our Heavenly Father a good Father? Is our Heavenly Father a loving Heavenly Father? Now, friend, if you've checked out at any portion of this message, this is the most critical portion. Give me your ear. Friend, if you're ever tempted to doubt the goodness of our Father, behold what He has done to make us His sons and daughters. For God so loved the world that He gave us His only begotten Son. But friend, He did so much more than merely commission or send His Son into the world. He crushed His Son for us. Isaiah 53, 10 and 11, it was the will of the Lord to crush Him. He the Father put Him to grief. He the Father made His soul an offering for guilt. He the Father saw His Son's anguish and was satisfied, for the Son bore our iniquities. You see, our loving Heavenly Father did what Father Abraham was called, but graciously prevented from doing. He made His Son eternally beloved, eternally obedient, eternally His delight to be sin for us so that we might be made the righteousness of God through Him. But He didn't stop there. He did more than just give us His Son. He also gave us His Spirit. Remember what Jesus promised, John 14, 16. And I will pray to the Father, and He, the Father, will give you another Comforter, another Helper, another Paraclete, that He may abide with you forever. Oh, brother and sister, consider the love of the Father. What He has done for His children to purchase your redemption. He sent forth His Son to apply and secure your redemption. He sent forth His Spirit economically and ontologically. Son and Spirit proceed from the Father. How can you worry and doubt the love of a father like that? Friend, how can you resist surrendering and resting in that love? To borrow from the argumentation of Paul, if he spared not his own son. Let me add something to that. If additionally, he spared not his own spirit. How will he not graciously with them provide you with everything you truly need?
Luke's desire is that those who fear God become fearless in their generosity or pursuit of God's kingdom as they grow in understanding the Father's love. For when we understand perfect love, it casts out all fear. My aim this morning has been to convince you that those who fear God can and ought be fearless in their generosity or pursuit of God's kingdom above all other things. And it's quite likely that when you've heard this text taught, the emphasis has been placed on anxiety or worry, but yet it's been disconnected with the call to be generous towards God with one's stuff. So was I correct to connect the call to be fearless with the command to be generous? We'll look at this more closely next week. But I want to quickly glance or attempt to answer that potential concern as we look ahead to see if we've been on the right course. Notice what Jesus commands in verse 32. Look at your text. We'll go here next week. Notice what Jesus commands in verse 32. Fear not. Right? I just validated my argument that we ought be fearless. Okay, what about the next part? Is the fearlessness really connected to generosity? Okay, look where Jesus goes in verse 33. You gotta look at it, you gotta look at the text. If you're looking, you don't have a Bible, call me, I'll get you one. They're available online. Watch, verse 33. Sell your possessions and give to the needy. The fearlessness ought free us to give. So now we're back to where we began. What would it look like if we really took Jesus seriously concerning fearing God? Not well. Would we be fearless in our generosity as we seek to advance God's kingdom above all other things? I believe the answer to my question is simple and clear. Perhaps your heart joins with mine in saying, Lord, I believe, yet help my unbelief. Let's pray. Oh, Father, the widow of Zarephath, would be called in that moment of testing when Elijah requested a gift that she thought she couldn't afford to give. She had one meal left for her and her son. That widow in that moment was so tempted to fear. To fear one. And yet she schools each of us today for she experientially discovered those who fear God ought be fearless. Every day she went back to that cruise. Every day she went back to that container of wheat. And there was enough for her and her son. God, I suppose, the widow that we're going to meet later in Luke, the one who gives everything in the temple, 
<clears throat> catching the eye of Jesus, I suppose that many a financial advisor would scoff. You can't afford to do that. Many a Pharisee mocked, ah, what a meager gift. And yet, and yet, and yet, whew, she, in that one transaction, purchased for herself a reputation that will eternally clothe her. And one day, we will rub shoulders with her in the streets of gold, and we will be humbled to be in her presence, one who gave everything out of her poverty. When we give so meagerly out of our excess. Oh, oh God, forgive us. God, I pray on behalf of our church, we believe, we believe we ought fear God, not wealth. We believe we ought give ourselves to the utmost for the advancement of the kingdom, physically, familially. We ought order our lives, every nook and cranny of our life, all consumed around the wartime agenda, expanding the kingdom. We are not on holiday. We believe this, Father. And yet, Oh God, forgive us, we disbelieve. We disbelieve. Help our unbelief. May we shine bright in the backdrop of our current day. For your glory and our good, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.